It's time for another Hour of Blessing on 3ABN. We are studying a lesson entitled, Three Cosmic Messages by Pastor Mark Finley. This is lesson number four, and the title is, Fear God and Give Glory to Him. If you do not have a lesson, go to 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com, and there you can download one for free. Get your Bible and join us. It's going to be a blessing. Welcome to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. This is lesson number four, Fear God and Give Glory to Him. My name is John Dinsey. It's a blessing for me to be with you along with my 3ABN family, well, part of the family that is here. And I'd like to introduce them to my left is Pastor Ryan Day. Amen. I have uh, Monday's lesson. It is entitled, Fearing and Obeying God. Amen. Sister Gio Morricone, Vice hey. President of 3ABN. Thank you, Pastor Johnny. I have Tuesday, which is living a God-centered life. Amen. Pastor John Lomacang, welcome. Yes, and mine is giving glory to God on Wednesday. Looking hey. forward to it. Amen, amen. Well, we have Professor Daniel Perrin here with us. <laughs> welcome. Thank you, and I've got the final lesson of the week, Thursday, good news to the overcomers. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, I'd like to ask Daniel Perrin to lead us in prayer. This We have to start with prayer. This is a wonderful lesson, and we want to make sure we are with the Lord. Please. Thank you. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we come to you today giving thanks to you that in your word we find strength and power, not to glorify ourselves, but to give glory to you. Lord, as we study today and as we learn, we commit ourselves again to let our lives shine the light that you put within us, the light of Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. Mm -hmm. amen. 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 Well, as we look at lesson number four, we see that it presents to us in the beginning that the world seems to be going about their everyday thing, not thinking about the signs that are all over the world telling us that Jesus Christ is coming soon. And the lesson brings out an interesting story about a stage and a clown. And in this uh, situation, there was a fire in the back of the stage that broke out, and this fire was getting dangerous. And uh, one of the clowns came out to warn the people, you got to leave the building. The building is on fire. But the people in the audience thought, well, this is just a joke, and they're laughing and laughing. And he urgently tried to tell them, please leave as soon as you can. There's a fire. And the more he pled with them, the more they laughed and they applauded not understanding the danger they were in. This is a story that's presented to us by Soren Kierkegaard. It's a parable that he came up with. It's not a real story, but it really illustrates the uh, things that are going on in the world. People are going about their everyday life as if nothing is happening. Every day will be another day. But in Luke chapter 17, verses 26 through 30, we have a message from God's Word that helps us understand that this is what we're going to be seeing in the last days. Notice Luke 17, beginning in verse 26. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were giving in marriage. Until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So when Jesus returns, this is what we are going to be seeing. People are going about their everyday life not knowing that Jesus Christ is coming. And this takes us to Sunday's portion of the lesson entitled, Fear God. And we're going to look at what does it mean to fear God? I'd like to read the opening uh, message here by Pastor Mark Finley in the lesson. It says, the purpose of the book of Revelation for our generation is to prepare a people to be ready for Jesus soon return and to unite with him in giving his last day message to the world. Revelation reveals the plans of God and unmasks the plans of Satan. It presents God's 
final appeal, his urgent, eternal, universal message for all humanity. And the question is, why does God even bother to make a final appeal? Mm -hmm. The Bible reveals that God is love, and he would love to see each and every one of his children repent and accept the great plan of salvation and escape the, uh, what is going to happen to people that the wages of sin is death if they don't repent. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, a, a very well-known passage in the Bible. For most people, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us. That means He's very patient with us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It is God's desire that all come to repentance. But you and I have been, giving, have been given a great gift, and that is the freedom of choice. You can choose what you want to do. God is not going to force anyone to be saved. The angels are not going to come down from heaven dragging people to accept eternal life. You must make a choice. And really, God has the best offer. What does Satan offer? Oh, enjoy yourself here and there, but in the end, you're going to burn in the fires of hell mm. and eventually die. Let's go look at Revelation chapter 14. Uh, I'm just going to read verse 6 and 7 uh, because here we have a message that we need to look at. The lesson said verse 7, but I want to look at verse 6 to give us a little context. Revelation 14, 6 and 7, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. This is everybody. This is the whole world needs to know this message. And this says, Saying with a loud voice, Fear God. And give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Mm -hmm. There's obviously here a message that we all need to know, all need to understand, and that it is a final appeal that God is making there in Revelation chapter 14 for each and every one of us. The whole world, every nation, kindred, tongue, and people needs to hear, needs to know this message urgently. And I praise the Lord for Three Angels Broadcasting Network that has been doing this since the fall of 1986. First began in North America, then eventually spread throughout the whole world. Amen. And for, uh, since 1986, that's amazing what God has done. Millions of people have heard this urgent message and millions more need to hear this message. But we need to ask ourselves, what does this word fear God means? Uh, the lesson brings out the Greek New Testament word for fear in Revelation 14, 7 is phobio. It is used here not in the sense of being afraid of God, but in the sense of reverence, awe, and respect. Mm -hmm. And God deserves all of that yes. because He is holy. He created us. He is daily providing for us. And we need to be in reverence all of His great love, His great mercy, and His desire for you to be saved, His desire for me to be saved. It is an attitude of mind that is God-centered rather than self-centered. This is what the lesson brings out. So I like to uh, go to some of the scriptures that are presented in the Bible but it is interesting. I want to ask this question. In the context of Revelation 14, 6, what does it mean to fear God? Yes, be in reverence, awe of Him. Mm -hmm. But there's an interesting passage uh, in Revelation chapter, I'm, I'm sorry, Proverbs chapter 8, that defines, that helps us understand a little more about what fear, what to fear God is. In Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13, this is not found in your lesson, so those of you following with the lesson, write it down. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance and the evil way and the perverse mouth I hate. Mm. So to fear the Lord is to hate evil. Now this is not something natural for human beings. We must have a change of heart. We must become a new creation in yes. Jesus Christ. Then being a new creation of Jesus Christ, the old things have passed away, all things have become new. The Lord helps us to learn 
to hate evil because all that evil does, there's this moment of joy, you enjoy it for a moment, but it does bring death. It does bring suffering to yourself and to others. So notice Psalm 97 verse 10. You who love the Lord hate evil. Mm. He preserves the souls of his saints. He delivers them out of the hand of the wicked. For God's children, there is a process that must be learned, and that is to hate evil because it causes suffering. Mm -hmm. Remember that in John chapter 14, verse 15, Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Mm -hmm. So when you think of fearing God, yes, there is an aspect of respect, of uh, fearing him because he is holy and he is merciful and loving to each and every one of us. And so out of love, out of gratitude for what he does for us, we should do what Jesus says. Mm -hmm. If we love him, keep his commandments. Mm -hmm. And really it is the commandments that help us understand what evil is. So this message uh, that to fear God is to hate evil is uh, joined together with the Ten Commandments because evil is shown to us by what the commandments say. And so let's go ahead and consider Psalms 34 and verse 11 beginning there. And there we're going to see how wonderful the Lord is because of our own, we cannot hate evil. Notice Psalms 34. Um, Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Mm. So if we want to learn how to hate evil, we have to come to the Lord. And the right. more you learn from the Lord, He is going to bless you step by step to learn to hate evil. Mm -hmm. Notice what it says, verse 12. Who is the man who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good, seek peace and pursue it. Mm -hmm. So this is all joined together. This is accompanied with the message that Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Mm -hmm. I'm reading to you from the lesson. It says, instead, uh, it is uh, to fear God, it is the attitude of Christ, who though being in the form of God, humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And so, the lesson continues by saying the essence of the great controversy resolves around the submission to God. Lucifer was self-centered. He refused to submit to any authority except his own rather than submit to the one upon the throne. Lucifer desired to rule from the throne. He wanted to take God's place. Put simply, to fear God is to place him, him first in our thinking. It is to renounce our self-centeredness and pride and to live a life holy for him. So good news also is found in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, yeah. uh, 12 and 13. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and tremble, trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Praise the Lord. In Signs of the Time, May 16, 1892, it says, The Lord has commanded us, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But what does this mean? It means that you feel your necessity, that you are poor in spirit, that you rejoice with trembling. It means that you know that in, every, in the very words you utter, you may make a mistake, that in the very best of your, your work, self may be so mingled that your efforts may be valueless. So we need to fear God and give glory to Him because the hour of His judgment has come. Learn to hate evil through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. amen, amen. Thank you, Pastor Denzi, for that great introduction. My name is Ryan Day, and I have lesson number two in this week's lesson, and it's entitled Fearing and Obeying God. And basically, this lesson is just extending uh, from what Pastor Denzi has already set the foundation for, and that is exploring, looking deeper into how we can indeed fear God. And as Pastor Denzi brought out very clearly, you know, we don't fear God in the sense that we tremble in our, in our clothes and run in the opposite direction because we're terrified of Him. 
No, this is a reverential awe. This is a respect. It's an honor that you have for him because he is God, because he is creator. And that's essentially what Monday is taking it a step further and saying, you know what? One other aspect that we uh, can learn to fear God and to show our reverence for him is obeying him, is simply living a life of obedience. And so uh, we're actually going to dive right into the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. This is, this is right within the context and previous to or before the great Shema there. Hero Israel, our, the Lord our God is one. And, uh, but right before that, this is what God says in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. It says, Now this is the commandment. And these are the statutes and judgments with the Lord, which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you, that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all His statutes and His commandments which I command you, you and your son and your grandson all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. In other words, this is God the Father, indeed the Father, a parent, our parent, our heavenly parent, who is saying to his children, saying to his people, I'm, I'm not only your God, I am your father and I want you to respect me. I want you to honor me. I want you to love me. I want you to, to have a, a, a reverence and an awe for me and understand that I am your God. I am your Lord. I am your creator. And uh, this isn't, you know, God saying, I want you to fear me, like I said before. And I want you to be terrified and trembled, even though they did when he came around. And when God's presence was there, especially when he was filling the temple and when he spoke from the mountain, the people would hit their faces and they would just tremble and shake because of God's presence, because of God's majesty. But nonetheless, God is not saying, run away from me, be terrified of me, He's saying, respect me, honor me. And what are one of the best ways that we can do that? Uh, even I, I think of a relationship between a parent and their children. One of the best ways that you can honor and respect your parents is simply by obeying them, showing that you care them, care for them and that you respect them by doing what they tell you to do and, and refraining from doing what they tell you not to do. And so even Psalms chapter 119 verse 73 also communicates this same powerful point. And it says here, your hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. Those who fear you will be glad when they see me because I have hoped in your word. I love that. And of course, the great, uh, probably the, the pinnacle uh, epicenter text, I guess you could say on this whole subject in fearing God and understanding the relationship between, again, fearing God and obeying him would be, of course, you can't leave out Ecclesiastes chapter 12, mm -hmm. verses 13 and 14. Um, the wisest man to ever live, right? Uh, with the exception of Christ. Solomon here, uh, in, 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 his, in the last words that he's writing in his great book of Ecclesiastes, where he's talking about life and the point of life and how all of life is vanity. But then he comes down to this one final major point And he says here in Ecclesiastes 12, verses 13 and 14, if he could just juice all of his wise mind down into just a few words, this is his final kind of thesis statement for all of what our, our goal and our purpose is in life. And he says here in verses 13 and 14, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. Or as the King James Version says, uh, well, though actually this is the King James Version. New King James Version says this is man's all, right? For God shall bring every work into judgment, this is verse 14, with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. And so this is our purpose. Our goal is to reverence God, to show Him and to respond to Him with obedience, to let Him know, Lord, we know who You are. We respect who You are. You are our God. And one of the best ways we can do that is simply following through in obedience. Obedience is the natural response to grace. I love that. That's good in the natural response to someone you respect and honor. I remember growing up in, in the Day family household, uh, you know, many, many people might say based on my parents' old school parenting style that, well, you respected them because they spanked you. Well, no, I, of course, you know, they put the fear in us often and the respect in us often because they did not put up with nonsense and they would, certainly weren't putting up with disrespect and disobedience. But uh, my parents did it in such a way, in an appropriate way, in a balanced way, and they did it in such a way that they would always talk 
talk to us and they would always share with us and they would always earn that respect and earn uh, that, that love and that honor that we had for them. But in our household, there was a respect. There was a, a, I guess you could say an appropriate reverence for our parents that when dad walked into the room and he said, son, clean your room. You didn't just stand there and look at him like he was some, you know, not on a log. You, you said, yes, sir. And you go do it. If mom said, hey, go in there, go out there and mow the lawn and have it done before your dad gets back. You know what? You don't sit there and, you know, think on it and ponder on it for the rest of the afternoon about, you know, hey, I don't know if I want to do this or not. And, and, and that seems to be kind of the mentality today among many households is that children have a choice. And it's not that we don't have a choice or that parents steal or take that away from us, but that you reverence, you respect, you honor the parents that God has given you. I, you know, this is the same relationship works with our God. I remember, uh, you know, years ago, uh, I was on my way to pick up my wife, Stephanie. She was doing her internship for her uh, education degree. And uh, we only had one vehicle at the time. And so I would drop her off in the morning and then I would pick her up in the evening. Well, on this particular afternoon after, you know, we were at the end of the day and I was going to pick her up, I, you know, went down the same little path, same little road that I always go on. And uh, I, on this particular day, I got a little excited because I was excited to go pick up my wife and see my wife. We hadn't seen each other in seven whole hours. And, uh, and so I topped this hill and as I was topping the hill, I looked down to the bottom and there was a cop. <laughs> and, I, and I knew immediately, I thought, well, there's no need for me to even hit the brake because he's already got me. Uh, so, of course, when I passed him, I just automatically started putting, applying the brake because I saw him pull out from behind me and he put his lights on. Needless to say, we, he pulled me over. He came to my vehicle. He asked me a few questions, you know, the, the usual, you know, your license, insurance and registration, all that stuff. And uh, where are you going? You know, why are you going so fast? And, you know, I told him, you know, I just kind of let get away from me. I wasn't paying attention. I take this route every day. I'm excited to go pick up my wife. And I told him that we attended the local Christian school and we were going to a Baptist school at the time. And, you know, I'm going to pick up my wife. She's doing her education degree and explained all that. He said, okay, give me a moment. He went back to his truck and I'm thinking, man, the last thing I need right now is a ticket. I'm a college student. I don't make a lot of money. I don't have the money to pay a ticket. And I started praying, Lord, please let this, let this cop have mercy on me. But in my mind, I remember thinking, you know what? I broke the law. I deserve that ticket. And more than likely, I'm probably going to get a ticket. Guy came back to my vehicle and he hands me my license, registration, insurance, proof of insurance back. And he says, hey, look, just have a great day. Slow it down a little bit. Go pick up your wife and enjoy the rest of your day. He goes and walks back to his vehicle, and, I, and, and I, at that moment I thought, oh, yes, I received grace. I, I, he was merciful on me, and he showed me grace. He, you know, I, I didn't deserve, or I deserve the penalty, but he didn't give me the penalty that I deserved. And so as he got in his car, and, or as he was walking to his car, I put my vehicle down in second gear, and I just... And I peeled out throwing rocks on the, on the cop car behind me because I was so excited that I was not under the law anymore. I had been shown <laughs> grace and I no longer needed to obey the law because he told me that I didn't have to have a ticket or that I wasn't going to receive the penalty for breaking the law. No. No, that's not exactly <laughs> what happened. My, <laughs> it was right the opposite. My natural response, obviously, uh, none of that happened. I didn't throw rocks in the car behind me, the cop car behind me. I literally, I was, so, I was just so blessed and just so thankful that I had been shown grace that my natural response was to put it in drive and ease slowly out onto the road and make sure I put my turn signal on and made sure I was following all the laws that I could because the natural response that I had been shown grace was that I wanted to, I respect the law now. I respected that law, man. I respected the fact that that law was put there to protect me and to keep me safe. And I wanted to follow it out of respect and honor. And that's the same thing for us. Ephesians chapter two, verses eight through 10 tells us that for by grace, you have been saved through faith and not of works. It is the gift of God, uh, excuse me, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before him that we should walk in them. We're not saved by works, but because we are saved by grace through faith, the natural response is that God has created us for good works. Even Romans chapter one, verse five clearly communicates this as well. It says through him that is Christ, we have received grace and apostleship for what? What's the response? What happens because of that grace? For obedience, it says, to the faith among all nations for his 
name's sake. So my friends, the point of, of Monday's lesson, fearing God and obeying him or fearing and obeying God is simply the fact that, you know what, we don't obey God because we feel that it's going to gain us entry into heaven or it's going to give us some kind of, you know, special gold stars beside our name. Every time we do something that God tells us to do, we do it because we love him. We do it because he first loved us and we obey him because we reverence him and we respect him as our loving heavenly father. Amen. 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 Well, this lesson has more blessings for us, but we're going to be back in just a moment, so stand by. Ever wish you could watch a 3 ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Welcome back. We continue now with Sister Jill Mariconi. Thank you so much, Pastor Johnny and Ryan. What an incredible lesson. Fear God and give glory to Him. I'm Jill Mariconi. On Tuesday, we look at living a God-centered life. I want to ask you, what is at the center of your life? Is the center of your life money or is it God? Is the center of your life pleasure or is it God? Is the center of your life power or is it God? Is the center of your life movies and entertainment or is it God? Is the center of your life music or is it God? Is the center of your life sports or is it God? Is the center of your life self, or is it God? Do you have a self-centered life or a God-centered life? You know, Matthew 6, verse 33 says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Mm -hmm. How do we seek God first? How do we live a god centered life. I think for people um, all throughout time, especially if we're Christians, we wrestle with this. How do we make God the center of our lives? Mm -hmm. I want to ask you another question. Where does your mind go when it relaxes? Maybe we shouldn't answer this question out loud. But where does your mind go when it relaxes? Some people, it might go to like plans and dreams and, oh, this is what I want to do tomorrow. Or some people, it might go to some place that you'd rather not tell other people about. Mm. Or some people might go to an idol or whatever you've made the center of your life. Mm. Where does your mind go when it relaxes? There's a quote from the lesson. I loved this one sentence here that Elder Mark Finley wrote. It says, the central issue in Earth's final conflict is the battle for the mind. That's the point. The central issue is a battle for your mind. Are you going to live a self-centered life or are you going to live a God-centered life? If we just drift along in life, Ryan, and we just say, oh, it doesn't really matter, and I can let my mind go wherever I want to let it go, and I can just be involved in whatever I want to do, Pastor John. If we just drift, God will not be the center of our lives. That's a fact. If we just allow it to drift, choice is essential right. to creating a God-centered life. That's right. So we're going to talk about six choices that you and I can make today to make God the center of our lives. And as we do this, we're going to incorporate the Bible verses that were found in my lesson for today. So choice number one, choose to allow God to give you the mind of Christ. So many times we think we have to strive to get the mind of Christ or we have to work harder to earn the mind of Christ. No. Look at Philippians chapter 2. Philippians 2 verse 5. What's that word? Let this mind be in you, mm -hmm. which was also in Christ Jesus. The word let in Greek means to allow or to choose. So in other words, we don't have to strive for the mind of Christ. We simply let Christ 
place his mind in us. We choose to allow him to give us the mind of Christ. Choice number one, choose to allow God to give you the mind of Christ. Choice number two, choose to think about Christ and heavenly things. Now, this is not always easy. If I'm being honest with you, it's not always easy for me to think about Christ and heavenly things. And if I'm being very transparent, I know I don't always do that right. I know that. That there are times when your mind wanders or your goes a certain place and maybe you want to go there instead of when God's tapping you on the shoulder. Well, bring it back to me and you're thinking, I'm not sure I want to go there right now. Choose to think about Christ and heavenly things. In Colossians, Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, it says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are on earth. Is that what it says? No. Seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. Hebrews 12, verse 2. We're going to spend some time in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 for several of our points. But Hebrews 12, verse 2 says, looking unto Jesus, yes. the author and finisher of our faith. You know, beholding Jesus is not just in the morning, I'm going to behold Jesus when I have my time with God in, in prayer and worship, and then I'm going to behold anything I want for the rest of the day. No. Beholding Jesus is a consistent pattern, yes. and it is a habit, you could say, that we can seek to cultivate or develop. Sure. Um, I've told the story before, but I'm going to tell it again. My husband, Greg, he's a fabulous driver. I love when he drives because I feel very safe. Um, and he doesn't start and stop and he doesn't swerve. He's just very steady when he drives. And this one particular time, there was a pothole in the road. We were driving down 57, which is the interstate here. And he avoided the pothole and he was kind of pleased with himself. You know, if Jill was driving, we would have hit the pothole because that's how I drive. But he avoided the pothole. And instead of keeping his eyes on the road, he looked in the rear view mirror to see how the car behind fared, where they can avoid the pothole too. Mm. Well, the truth was there were two potholes in the road. And just at the moment when he looked behind to see how the car behind did, he hit the second pothole in the road. Mm. And I'll never forget, he was really mad at himself because he strives on being this really careful driver and here he had hit that pothole. Why? Because he had taken his eyes off the road. It's so important when we think about Christ and heavenly things that it's a consistent looking to Jesus. We don't look to Jesus and then look around at other people. We don't look to Jesus and look behind us. No, we consistently look to Jesus. Okay. Choice number three, choose to say no to sin. We're still in Hebrews 12, Hebrews 12, verse 1. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily besets us or so easily ensnares us. New Living Translation, the sin which so easily trips us up. Mm. What are we supposed to do with those sins? Choose to say no to sin. Mm -hmm. There's a verse, uh, Jesus talking, this is in Mark. Mark chapter 9, we won't, won't read the whole passage, but Mark 9, starting in verse 43, it says, if your hand causes you to sin, what do you do, Daniel? Cut it off. Cut it off. Mm -hmm. It's better for you to enter life maimed rather than having two hands and go to hell. Verse 45, if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. Mm -hmm. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Ooh, I used to read that and say, why is God being so harsh? You know, if you're working with poison, you don't just put a label on it, you dispose of it. Mm -hmm. Jesus is not promoting self-mutilation. What he's saying is that sin in your life and in mine, it needs to be dealt with That's right. mm -hmm. quickly at any cost. Do not explain away sin. Do not excuse sin. Do not rename sin. Do not justify sin. Do not minimize sin in your life. Mm -hmm. When drastic action is required, take drastic action. Mm, right. That goes along with choice number four. Choose to make no provision for the flesh. We're going to Romans 13 verse 14. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. In other words, if your addiction is pornography, maybe you need to cut off that television channel mm. or maybe you need to 
uh, put filters on your internet access. Mm -hmm. Choose to make no provision for the flesh. Right. Choice number five, choose to look at the goal. Now we talked in choice number two, choose to look at Jesus, how important it is to look at Jesus. But Jesus also looked at the end goal. We see that in Hebrews 12 verse two. First of all, it says looking unto Jesus, how important it is to look at Jesus. That was choice number two. Then it says, who for the joy that was set before him, that's the end yes. goal, endured the cross, despising the shame, and was set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Christ could endure the cross because of the joy of your and my salvation. We need to choose to look at the end goal, which is eternal life with Jesus. Mm -hmm. This world that we have is not all there is. Choose to look to the hereafter. And finally, number six, choose to persevere in the journey. Mm -hmm. Don't give up. Don't get discouraged. Don't get tired. If you feel like, wow, I don't have a God-centered life today, get up tomorrow and try again. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 12, 1, let us run with endurance the race that is set before yes. us. He who endures to the end will be saved. So it's a daily choice that you and I can make and we can reap the benefits of living a God-centered life. Amen. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, John. And I'll tell you, mine is give glory to God. This one passage is so potent, there's so much in it. Mm -hmm. But I'm gonna read it again just in case you missed it. Revelation 14, verse seven, saying with a loud voice. Now let's stop right there. This is something that has to be proclaimed everywhere. It has to be apparent that what is to follow is vitally important. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of waters. Five different topics are in that singular scripture. And mine is simply to point, give glory to God. We live in a world today where the glory of God is hidden, but the glory of God is not uh, obscure. Now, what do I mean? People choose to hide God's glory from pervading their lives, but God's glory refuses to be hidden. And what I'm going to do is walk you through some elements in scripture where we find how important God's glory is. Uh, and, and also quote something that really impressed me. Uh, when you're gifted, it's important to understand what that gift is all about and the extent of that gift. Uh, but Pastor Finley brings out in the introduction of Wednesday, he says, the study of the use of the phrase in the Old Testament to give glory to God shows that it, interestingly enough, often but not only appears in the context of divine judgment, just as it does in the first angel's messages as well. So you find the glory there is connected to judgment. So what is that saying? If we refuse to give God the glory that he is due, judgment will follow. A lot of people don't choose to give God glory because they don't see any ramifications that come after that. So let me show you a couple of things about what the Bible says in the Old Testament about God's glory. I start with Isaiah 42 and verse eight. And the, and the application here is God's glory is exclusive. God's glory is exclusive. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. And uh, a number of years ago, I heard a phrase that I never forgot. One of my favorite writers, Oswald Chambers, he says, never use God's gifts to rob God of his glory. Yes. And today, uh, I, I need to say it, the Christian world is replete with that. Yeah. I've seen it plastic, I've seen it plastered all throughout Christianity. It even behooves me today, how can you give a Christian artist an award for singing? Honestly, think about that. That's God's glory. That's right. We follow the patterns of the world when we say, well, you, song of the year, how many people have found Christ? How many people have given their lives to Christ because of the song you just sang? That's the glory that the Bible is saying, don't steal God's glory. Do not use God's gifts to rob God of his glory. My glory, I will not give another. And so preaching, singing, teaching, never say I'm such a good teacher that God should not get the glory. Matter of fact, when people compliment, I've, there's a book that I read called um, uh, The Difference Between Compliments and Flattery. And it's so vitally important when you're working for the Lord to understand the difference. Somebody might say that sermon touched me. 
Say, praise God for that. If I could be a blessing to you, praise God for that. But don't say, yeah, that was one of my really good ones, wasn't it? You know, no, God's glory is what we are to do. Give all the glory to God. The other one is not only God's glory is exclusive, but God's glory is pervasive. Isaiah 6 and verse 3. And one cried to another and said, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. This is what amazed me about atheists. You can't find God's glory for the same reason a crook can't find a police. You don't want to. You don't want to. But the entire, if you look around you, as far removed as we are from perfection at creation, God's glory is still there on a beautiful spring morning when creation is starting to wake up, when the earth is covered by the snow that God sends down and sin has been covered. It reminds us of the redemption of God. When you come out on a beautiful snowy morning, no footprints in the snow, no tracks. It's like, wow, yes, your sins can be as white as snow. God cleans us up. God's glory is everywhere. The other thing about it is God's glory is imperative. Paul, the apostle, talks about a generation that knew God but chose not to glorify him. Romans 1 verse 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. There it is, all of creation. Yes. Being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, that they are without excuse. So nobody could say, I didn't see God. <clears throat> but here's the problem, verse 21. Because although they knew God, this is, this is not worldly, worldlings. This is people that say, I know God. They did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile or vain in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. God's glory is imperative. You must give God, if you know God, give him the glory. Don't rob that glory to yourself. And there's so many people today, you know, we remember them rather than remembering the God in them. And that's where God's glory is imperative. Give that glory back to God. And so I have, Jill, as it were, six ways that yeah. God's glory can be given. And um, ways to glorify God. Let's start with, I just read Romans 1, verse 20 and 21. That's the first one. But the other one is 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19 and 20. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19 and 20. The one is glorify God because you know him. That's the first one. The second one is glorify God in your body. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19 and 20. And, and I like the King James Version, but I have the New King James. I like the way that Paul says, what? <laughs> what? And he's talking to people that should know better. What? Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? He's like saying, do you, do you, do you not know that? And you are not your own. People say, this is my body. No, that's not your body. You didn't design it. You didn't shape it. For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And so today, a lot of people say, oh, I'm in the spirit. God said, be in the body also. Because what we do in our body, we will give an account that we must all give an account of the things done in the body. Mm -hmm. So don't just say, this is my vessel, poking holes in it, mm. painting it, altering it. As one preacher said, you can get all the augmentations you want, but your kids will remind you how ugly you really are. And so watch out with all that plastic this and plastic that. <laughs> you know, I just want to say that. I know it shocked you, but it's, it's a reminder that <laughs> it shocked you, didn't it, Joe? <laughs> It reminds us that let's glorify God with what we have. Don't say, God, you made a mistake and I need to really augment this. Anyway, while you're getting over that, let me go to number three. <laughs> glorify God through your body, not just in your body, but through your body. First Corinthians 3, verse 16 and 17. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? Now, this is vitally important. When you become a new creation in Christ, the spirit takes up residence in your body. So from that point on, you just can not do with your body as you please. You cannot be a person given to immorality or, or sensuality or carnality because the spirit of God said, wait a minute, what are you doing in my house? What is what's going on with it? Excuse me. Excuse me. I'm living here now. Thank you very much. I want to make that real. Your body becomes the resident, the residing place of God's Holy Spirit. He comes in to reconstruct that terrible nature. 
Justification forgives you of the past transgressions, but sanctification says, I got to make sure that you don't do this again. Mm. Make sure your body is God's temple by the residing presence of the spirit. Because the verse 17 says, if anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him mm. for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. The fourth one, glorify God in your works. Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Sim similar to that, don't take God's glory to yourself. Mm -hmm. Now, why is that so vitally important? I'm going to speak like a New Yorker now, Jill. Here it is. Our works reveal us. They profess to know God, Titus 1, 16, but in works they deny him. Our works reveal us. Mm -hmm. Secondly, our works confirm us. Revelation 2 verse 13, I know your works. Our works confirm us. We may say things, but the Bible says, hey, I know what you're saying, but I see what you're doing. Third thing, our works survive us, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. If you live an ungodly life, you can be the best preacher, singer, teacher on earth, but people said, I remember him for who he is. Mm -hmm. So be careful with how you live. Number, f number five, Glorify God through our conduct. Peter said, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. When the Lord comes, he'll say, not only did you speak well, but you lived the way you should have. And finally, glorify God in unity. Romans 15, verse 6, that you may with one mind and with one mouth glorify God and the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. Let the unity that, that brothers and sisters have be a glory so people that are on the outside might say, wow, the reason I know God is here is they are in harmony. They are in unity. Whatever you do, fear God and give glory to him. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Lomakang. This is a powerful study this week, and uh, I'm sure appreciating it. I'm Daniel Perrin, and I have Thursday's lesson, Revelations Overcomers. And overcomers, it's not just talk. It's not just words that, that can get us excited. There is real living power in your life, my life today to actually overcome. And we find Revelation's overcomers introduced to us in chapters two and three of Revelation, where Jesus is giving messages to seven churches. There are churches that are doing well. There are churches that are doing poorly. Churches under persecution, churches battling deception. And in every single one of those churches, there are overcomers and to each one of them is given a promise because the power of overcoming rests on the promises of God, not on our power alone. Uh, from the lesson, Mark Finley included this sentence here, Revelation's message is one of victory, not of defeat. And that is so important to remember that uh, we're, we're not going to be fighting a battle where there's going to be defeat on the horizon. We could choose that if we so desire, but the enemy is defeated, death is defeated, the curse that covers this earth is defeated, and sin, not just a concept out there, but sin in our lives is defeated. And so we don't hear the Bible talking like this. Well, God gave it his best try. No, it says things like this, Revelation 3, 21, and this is the message to the Laodicean church, uh, the one that is, uh, seems to have some of the worst problems. It says, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Every bit of overcoming is contingent upon Jesus overcoming. And that's already done in the past, what he did there for us on the cross and what he's doing for us in heaven. So you don't have to worry. I don't have to wonder whether or not I'm going to make it here safely in my car this morning because it's already in the past. I know it's finished. And so we can look at the past and then we can have confidence right here and now. Join me in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 23 and 24. Such an excellent promise here that Paul, under inspiration, is giving for you. And he begins with this word, now. Right there, right now. May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, that's the breath of life from God that animates you and your soul, that's you as a person and your body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then verse 22, 24, he who calls you is faithful and who also will do it. Amen. He who calls you is faithful. 
who also will do it. This is an invitation to take Jesus at his word, not just to believe it in your mind, but to step out in action. Okay. And so we've got to start with the right attitude here. All of heaven praises God's power constantly. We see that in chapter four of Revelation and five and seven and 15. And so this is why Jesus gives us this prayer. Thy will be done in Matthew 6, 10 on earth as it is in heaven, that we can here on earth say, Lord, you have all power and I want it to be exhibited in my life. Okay. So we don't say things like, ah, I can't overcome. I, I can't stop sinning. We might say, Lord, I am weak, but you are strong, but not, Lord, it's impossible. When we say this, we're saying he who promised is not faithful mm. and he will not do it. But that's not what the promise is. It says he who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. And this isn't some pop psychology that says you can be whatever you want to be, the powers in you. No but you can do whatever God calls you to do by the power that he places within you. Right. So this is why we are called not to ever breathe a word of defeat or of impossibility or futility, because remember, as it's been said, the battles for our minds, it's for our thoughts. And in our thoughts, we say, Lord, you have conquered, you are victorious. Mm -hmm. The enemy loves to hear us talk of failure, talk of defeat, talk of his power and exalt his false glory, but he's already defeated. That's right. In the book of Revelation, 17 times we have the word that is translated as overcomer. Sometimes we see prevailed or conquered or victory. And in each of those instances, it's from the Greek word nikao. We can translate that sometimes as Nike. There's a reason why people wear Nikes, they wanna win. We actually have Nike missiles somewhere because we want to win. We want to be victorious. And, but that word nikao says to prevail, to be victorious, to overcome, and to win the case. That's a part of the definition there because there's a pending case against you. There's an enemy who is accusing you. Listen to Revelation 12, 10. The accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Amen. Well, what's, what's he accusing you of? And he says, they're not victorious. Look what they've done. Look at their sins. Look at the record of their life. And then accusing God, you have no right to save and take these people to heaven. They've chosen me. Look at their sinful behavior. But the testimony is this, to the overcomers. But how, how do we overcome? Revelation 12, 11, the very next verse, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives unto death through the power of Jesus. That's where it is. Amen. Revelation 14, verse 12 says, here's the patience of the saints. We love this text. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. And that gives us the, the instructions about how to keep the commandments of God. How is it? By the faith of Jesus. Right. What a rich phrase. This is not just faith in Jesus, but which we should have, but this is the faith of Jesus, the faith that he had. So you want to be an overcomer, then meditate upon the life of Jesus. Look to him and see the faith in his life. Look at him who had a pure picture of the love of God because this is where following God begins to understand his love and to see him for who he really is. And that's what our enemy is trying to hide all along so that we don't see the love of God. The victorious life begins by meditating on him. We follow Jesus as he leaves the courts of heaven, trusting fully in the, God, in the Father's power to come to this earth, to make himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men, Philippians 2, 7. We follow him as he resists temptation with the word of God in Matthew 3. We follow him as he holds tightly to the Father through a night of prayer and through days of prayer. We follow him as he says, when the Father is working, I'm working, John 5, 17. We follow him into the Garden of Gethsemane where he says, thy will be done. Regardless of what happens, he says, Lord, Father, is there any other way? 
But then he says, thy will be done. And then we follow him to the cross where he could have come down from the cross of his own power at any point, but he did not love his life unto death. And he says, I will give it up for the will of the father. So this is how we give glory to him. We have the faith of Jesus. I'm going to go back to that text that Jill used there in Hebrews 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And I love the translation that says, fixing our eyes on Jesus. This is not a glance. This is not a, a look for a moment, but staring intently at Jesus and who he is. And I don't think we can repeat this often enough. If you want to be victorious, then we meditate upon the life of Jesus. And this gets practical in your life because we don't overcome all at once, but we overcome today because there's temptations and there's struggles that you are going to face today. And you know what they are. God does too. And it says that he knows our frame there in Psalm 103. He knows that we are dust. And what that doesn't, doesn't mean is that he makes allowances for our sin. But think about this. You head into the store and there's that section that always tempts you with the indulgence of appetite. And so you meditate on Jesus and you take him as your, at his word and you say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. That indulgence of appetite with the electronic device that demands your time and your mind that belong to God. You meditate on Jesus and you take him at his word and you say, be strong in the power in the Lord and in the power of his might. Right. Ephesians 6.10, his might, not mine. When the temp temptation for unrighteous anger arises and you know it's going to come. God does too. You meditate on him and you say, he gives power to the weak and to those who have no might, he increases their strength. That's Isaiah 40 verse 29. We can be victorious overcomers through Christ who strengthens me. And so we look to Jesus, not just once a day, but moment by moment. Amen. 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 Thank you, Daniel, Par Daniel Perrin. And we uh, have a moment to say final comments, we start with Pastor Ryan. Amen. You know, Pastor uh, Mark Finley brings out in the lesson here, he says, the Christ of Scripture never leads us to minimize the doctrines of the Bible. The Christ of Scripture never leads us to reduce his teaching to pious platitudes that are non-essential. Christ is the embodiment of all doctrinal truth. Christ is truth incarnate. He is doctrine lived out. Amen. I've been so blessed by this lesson. It's so practical. When you look at living a God-centered life, it all starts with a choice. That's right. And that's why the highest effect on earth that can be evidence that Christ is in you is you allow him to receive glory through your life. Romans 8:37 says, yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors. The word there is hyper Nike above and beyond victory through him who loved us. Amen. Amen. Thank you. What a blessing this lesson has been. And we hope you have been blessed. We want to encourage you to remember that the first angel's message is fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. We encourage you to continue looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. This Jesus Christ, who came to this world to die for us, today is alive and well helping us to be victorious, and by His grace, we will be. Join us for next week's lesson, lesson number five, the good news of the judgment.